thank you so much for that wonderful beginning. And again, that song was Lila June's Cheyenne Navajo song, All Nations Rise. And in that spirit, I, located here um, in the AMBS community and broader area, we acknowledge that we, our presence on the traditional homeland of the Pokagon Band of the Potawatomi, a sovereign tribe. Despite the forced removal of many people, the Pokagon Potawatomi have been using this land for formation and education for thousands of years and continue to do so. So thank you, Sarah, for bringing June's voice into this space and invite, inviting us to rise up together. I have a few housekeeping items as we get started. This main session is being recorded. The breakout sessions that will follow will not be recorded. In view of that and in preparation for the breakout sessions, um, you may want to update your Zoom name as you see fit perhaps including your location, your pronouns, or um, whatever you want to communicate to the fellow participants. Um, we're going to invite you to keep your audio and your video off during the full group sessions to help other participants focus on the speaker. And with that, we want to again welcome you to the colloquium series on nonviolent action and movements for justice in 2020. My name is Jana Hunter Bowman. I'm Assistant Professor of Peace Studies and Christian Social Ethics at Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary. And in welcoming you, I'm joined by Jason Shank and Sibo Nokushle Nokuwe. So I'll let them introduce themselves, please. Like Jana said, my name is Jason Shank. I've been a, a Quaker minister um, focusing on the People's History of Elkhart Project and work with the Poor People's Campaign and National Call for Moral Revival. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I am Swanogutle Nube, a humanitarian relief and development practitioner and student at AMBS. I am currently a student assistant with the Peace Studies Department. Welcome once again. So serving as living alternative to violence through offering protection and seeking justice is an expression of a nearly 500 year tradition of Anabaptism. The communal nonviolence is rooted in the conviction that violence is inconsistent with the person of Jesus and the life he led, a life the discipleship community shares. In this series, co-sponsored by the Kroc Institute for International Peace at the University of Notre Dame, so again, this series is embedded in this colloquium. In this series, voices from different streams of nonviolence, including communal, liberationist, and strategic nonviolence, will speak as witnesses to the power of nonviolence in action. The events of 2020 are laying bare inequalities that have long plagued the United States and the global community. The intersections of the pandemic ongoing racialized violence and hate-filled political rhetoric combined with the volatility of the upcoming U.S. presidential elections are exposing the costs of the status quo and pushing each of us to examine our role as advocates for justice. This four-part series explores these issues and strategic nonviolent responses. And to launch this series, we have Sarah Nahar. In the August 2020 edition of The Mennonite, Sarah Nahar wrote, to be a pacifist means to be willing to find alternatives to war wherever violence is showing up. Her life bears witness to this form of pacifism linked with liberation, lineage, and village, the subtitle of the article. Many in this room already know this. For the friends, colleagues, and co-conspirators she's not yet met, I offer a few highlights. Sarah is a PhD student in the Department of Religion at Syracuse University and visiting instructor in the Department of Environmental Studies at the State University of New York's College of Environmental Science and Forestry. There she is asking the question, how do beliefs about the earth and the end times influence toileting practices of religious people? She studies what she calls the poop loop and is dedicated to getting our carbon waste out of the hydrological cycle. Am I getting this right, Sarah? 
In other words, main mainstreaming usage of composting toilets. Sarah is a licensed minister within the Central District Conference of Mennonite Church USA and co-consultant to the developing board of the Tolson Center in Elkhart, Indiana. She is also the former executive director of Christian Peacemaker Teams. Through these roles, she has provided leadership to multi-faith partnerships to transform violence and oppression. But leadership through partnership is not always highly visible. For example, I, for one, have deeply appreciated your creative work with Mennonite Jewish relations, Sarah. Sarah holds a BA from Spelman College and a Master of Divinity from Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary. Indeed, Sarah and I first met in those halls on the AMBS campus in her hometown in Watershed. We were both at AMBS at students at the time. The conversations we had in the students' lounge portend the life and witness to the power of nonviolence in action for justice that I just sketched. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us again today, and I turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you. It is so good to be with so many of you that represent, indeed, my village, from whence I come and to whom I'm accountable, as well as those who've been working for liberation from so many lineages that bring us to this particular moment together. Where I wanna start is in Charlottesville in 2017. In many ways, a scenario that has happened many times in this soil of Turtle Island, but in some ways, a moment of a wake up call again for this generation. As people of faith and conscience walked to a park in the center of Charlottesville, Virginia on Monacan Lane and said, there is no place for hate here, only for humanity. They expected to find a line of police officers that were defending the Constitution of the United States in the sense of the status quo of the right to free speech and park permits and things of that nature for any group that wished to gather, no matter their political belief. When they arrived at this park, however, where a group of people called Unite the Right, so many different right-wing groups that had similar and different philosophies, but were coming together to oppose uh, the changes that relate to many of the civil rights and women's rights, indigenous rights and other gains over time were meeting. They were intending to unite, unite the right was intending to rally there. Uh, uh, some of those organizers were just getting there, but there weren't any cops in sight. They weren't blocking the park. Hmm. So the leaders that had organized together representing a grassroots movement again of people of faith and conscience from many different organizations across the middle and, and, and the left said to themselves that we will stand here to try to make sure that there's no platform for hate today and seek a different way to engage one another. They then expected that eventually the state, as in the police, would come and disperse them because they were committing civil disobedience and that they were blocking a lawfully uh, allowed group of people to, to, to the space that they uh, had desired to access. But the state stood down and instead, the people who uh, had organized to create the Unite the Right rally right at the appointed time came from all angles on many sides to come to the place of their, of their rally. This meant then, instead of a clash with the police officers, there was a civilian on civilian clash. All of a sudden, the optics that the pastors and the other people of conscience had imagined would be there. Police dispersing them in order to allow for people who were armed and who were espousing violence to meet did not happen. All of a sudden, the rights that the pastors and others knew they had when facing the state dissolved 
because they didn't have those same types of rights and same types of expectations when facing another civilian. Many of you saw those images from Charlottesville on August 12 and in the months preceding it as, as well. As then what happened next was the state finally coming, but instead of acting with force to uh, resist the right wingers or to stop the platform for hate, really did clear out those who were seeking to keep the peace, seeking to continue inclusion. Many things began to happen as civilian on civilian clashes spread throughout that area of Charlottesville. And one included um, someone from the Right Unite the Right Wing rally, ramming their car at full speed into a crowd of people who sought to create inclusion and peace, then backing up and trying to ram again. Heather Hare was killed, many others were injured. Those who had rallied with the clergy and other, other folks such as uh, Rednecks Revolt and a number of other groups who had come to try to support Charlottesville residents in that space, quickly mobilized their medical teams who are on the ground with people already. These are street medics. These are folks who've been trained up in direct first aid, not necessarily holding RNs or MDs, but ready to assist. They were the first responders. They were there. And around them, the clergy and others created walls, some facing in, some facing out, chains of protection. They began immediately to administer first aid and trauma. Finally, when the state's medical response team came, they came also accompanied by armed people who began to push out those medical first responders who began to break up the community's first response in another wave of, of violence and to stop people from even giving some of the CPR that was absolutely needed, causing some people to go into even further critical condition. No one was shot directly in Charlottesville that day which was ended up being a surprise, but it didn't happen. And so what we ended up seeing with Charlottesville was what I call a deterioration of democracy. There are many levels on which democracy can deteriorate. And before August 12, as we prepared and were on the ground with uh, civilians and community members, I'm using the term civilians here, we use it a lot in international um, humanitarian and peace work. It means non-combatants. means someone who's not a part of a military or police force. We were working and training civilians and unarmed civilian accompaniment and protection and how to um, be with one another in these times. They weren't sure how far democracy would deteriorate on that day and some expected the worst. Some expected all out warfare and bloodshed from handguns and rifles in the streets. We didn't know what the state would do. We had guesses. And uh, one of the guesses is that they would stand down to some, to some extent, but I wasn't sure what that would mean, and we weren't sure when they would re-engage. What all this does is paint a, a picture of something that has been changing in some ways since preparation for nonviolent direct action, which we inherit from um, the Black freedom struggle in the 60s, American Indian movement, the Poor People's Campaign, and many other ways of mobilizing in which the state was very present and did a lot of the official repression. We've seen this also all the way through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And so the current new deteriorations have to do with state response being very different and allowing for certain mm -hmm. civilians to continue to uh, have power within the space. As Mennonites and Anabaptists who were present that day and throughout our work who have not necessarily desired to rely on the state at all, nor, nor continue to wish to do so, there's, also, there's, there's not a surprise that the, the state was not in a helpful role. And also for many people of color and others um, who have experienced extreme amounts of state violence, it also wasn't a surprise that, that the state did what it did, but it presents new challenges. 
For one, the challenge of optics. Um, another, the challenge of communication. Another, the recognition that the expectations that you have from everything from pleading the fifth um, when you're speaking with an officer to knowing the rules of engagement that a state has where they have to tell you why you're being arrested and detained. They must say that you have one phone call should you be taken to jail. All of these things are off when it comes to civilian on civilian conflict. The reason that understanding civilian civilian conflict is important is because substate warfare is growing all over the world. And as we are potentially in an antebellum period now, the type of war that we will face that of course builds on the already undeclared constant war against black and brown people in this country will be one of substate warfare. We are a country awash in guns and as senses of connection deteriorate, there is generally rises in violence and already we're in a situation where there are mass shootings each day. Um, the war that will be coming will not look like the ones that necessarily we've, we've had in the past here, but there's a lot of knowledge about these types of wars from around the world, as well as in, in people's own lives. So we are not without resources and support for thinking about how we might show up effectively mm -hmm. and communally at this time. It's just gonna look really different than large marches and actions and doing some of the public type tactics that we've now matured in social movements for a long time. I'll just share one, one thing that we worked on in, prep in preparation for what happened August 12 in identifying harm that could potentially be happening. And I wanna share this with you because it's a practical thing that you can use already beginning now and potentially as we head into a contested election in November we use the acronym SALT. Now salt's very precious to us, right? This want to be the salt of the earth. And if salt loses its saltiness, what is it? It's just thrown outside and trampled underfoot. And in Syracuse actually is a city that produced a lot of salt for a long time. And so it's an easy acronym to, to remember and I invite you to, to think about it when you see the salt shaker uh, on, your, on your table, if, if, it's, if it's not too difficult. It, uh, SALT is a, it's a four part acronym when you see harm, and, uh, excuse me, four-part acronym, and I give it to you to help right-size paranoia. It, it is okay to be scared at this time. It's okay to be worried. It's okay to have heightened vulnerability. But not everything is going to crash and crumble. You will not lose everything. It's important to think about uh, what we are willing to give up and shifts we are willing to make in these times to help promote safety and protect one another and protect the earth. But what will actually happen may not be what we expect to happen. And so SALT is one acronym that helps to, to right size our, our fear and, and give us some tools to communicate with others. So SALT stands for size, activity, location, and time. I'll go over these. Uh, one by one. If you're seeing someone who is carrying a weapon or someone who has a paraphernalia from a, from a say a white supremacist group or someone um, whose actions worry or trouble you for, for any reason or groups of people, salt, it can be helpful. So size is related to what is the size of the group, potentially also the size of the, of the people the, the size of the group that's, that's doing this activity. And, and what is their activity actually? Are they marching around? Are they brandishing weapons? Are they yelling? Are they harassing? Are they sitting on the ground quietly? Are they on, on phones and using technology? So what's the activity of, of, of a group that you might see doing a disturbing activity? What's their location? This location is primarily related to them being at the corner of Green Road and US 33. So give an example of a random quarry. Or is their location near a school? 
or are they moving towards one place to another? Walking south on green, for example, location. And time, both the, the time of day to try to record that as well as the duration of time that you're able to, to monitor the situation. You can, uh, if someone tells you, oh my goodness, I'm really scared, there's all these people here, what's happening? You might be able to text back to them, salt. And then that helps a person look at the various factors that might be the most salient when identifying a group that may or may not be attempting to do harm, but it also is a way to locate uh, what's happening. And then if you're networked with other people in your community or otherwise, and they, ha and they send out a salt alert and it's the same group of people in another place, you start to be able to, to track. And I think, this is a, I think this is particularly important when we're dealing with armed actors. People also use this um, for the police, which are a group of, of, of armed actors as well. But when you have multiple sets of armed actors, your nonviolent direct action needs to be multifaceted as well as agile. It needs to recognize what type of weapon you're dealing with and what type of, of actor. Political Research Associates has put out um, a uh, wonderful resource that will tell you um, which paraphernalia of which white right-wing groups is worn where and how and what is the discipline of that group and what are they allegiant to. And, and these all give you points of intervention with which to be able to talk to the, to the group and approach them potentially or not and to let, and to let others know. Salt also becomes important if you do not want to rely on the police for reasons of abolition, for reasons of desiring to, to not call on lethal force in order to try to leverage a situation. Salt can also help, help in creating those networks as well. People are really traumatized after what went down in Charlottesville and in doing some aftercare with a lot of them, we. We were sure to, to let them know that even though they, they felt like the, that their community was fragmented and it was devastating for many clergy, when other clergy just said, oh, you know, ignore it, it'll go away, or I'm not, I'm not interested in saying, no, I, I have to, we'll, we'll just focus on what we want to build as an alternative. There's a lot of fractures in the community. And yeah, we assured the, the people of, of Charlottesville that, that their investment in trying to show up in the, in the many ways they did, both building alternatives, blocking harm, and just working hard and being alignment with their, with their deepest values, has resourced um, us a lot to understand kind of the moment that we're, that we're coming into. As I conclude for this initial part, um, what some in the, Unite, the Right Rally were trying to do was to begin, start a racial holy war. Not all, they have different philosophies, but as some were. What this means and what this uh, poses as a challenge to those who are in traditionally pacifist communities who have resisted the draft and have, who have said, we will not participate. What happens when your body drafts you? How are we to respond when there's not an opt-out option? So what we're gonna work on today and throughout time, I'm accessible and the other hosts of this seminar are accessible to continue in this movement together, is how might we take our next step into solidary learning and living in these times together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your, your really powerful message, for sharing with us stories of these very real and present in contemporary situations of harm, but also the way that different kinds of people are coming together and recognizing these as opportunities to bear witness. Um, thank you for helping us think about what it means to show up effectively and communally, and to think, to, to provide a practical tool for doing just that through, through this SALT, through SALT. Um, in this, what we want to do next is to move into breakout groups. So what we're going to do is to um, organize different participants into small groups. You'll have eight minutes in, in your breakout session. And Sarah invites you to think about this question. 
um, as a result of what I've just heard, what is my next step on my own learning journey of solidarity? You're also welcome to, to pose questions that emerge for you in the course of the talk generally. So in a moment, we're going to move into breakout groups, perhaps start by introducing yourself and then responding to the prompt. And I believe that the prompt will appear in the chat box in a moment. You'll have eight minutes and then we'll come back to the large group session for some Q&A. See you soon. As the questions come in, I just want to speak to the song that we heard from Lila June Johnson, who is an artist and activist, and uh, she is Dene Navajo as well as Cheyenne. And it was important to me to begin with this song because even myself, descendant of both willing and unwilling settlers on colonized land, we are working uh, in ways to always be accountable to, to those who are advocating for rematriation and, and helping us think about values change for survival. And we think about indigenous communities, this is not the first um, disease that they have faced from folks that are not from here coming upon them. And so Navajo Nation particularly has been really impacted. So just wanna just um, raise up some of, the, some of their leadership who are speaking to that. And as she said, this, this coming, this situation is not Indians versus Cowboys. No, it is all of humanity on one side fighting to replace our fear with love. And the only weapons that are helpful are weapons of truth, faith, and compassion. One question I see here are some resources I would recommend in this work towards empty violence and listening to the voices of Black and Brown sisters and brothers. I'm happy to say that during the breakout rooms, we organized to uh, say that we're gonna be sending you a follow-up with a number of links and resources so you can find your way in if you haven't already. There is, there is a place uh, for you in this work because this is the work of the body of Christ. And so everyone can bring their gifts, I would say, um, if you can follow the through thread on the impact of the doctrine of discovery, which is a 1455 and onward set of papal bulls that um, first displaced and kidnapped indigenous Africans and then uh, assisted in the perpetuation of genocide here uh, in, this, in this continent um, and has morphed into, into Christian Zionism and other forms of theological racism today. There is a through line there. So anything you can find out about the doctrine of discovery and there's a number of people working to dismantle the doctrine of discovery and to see how it shows up, that, that's a great place to, to, to start. And, and many black and brown people have been inviting folks to come work on it with them to address it, both repudiate and, and rematriate. And then we'll send some more, some more resources for sure. Yes, what training is available now online since COVID prevents some trainings in person? Uh, we will also in that, in that resource, uh, make sure that you have access to a, a few trainings as well as there are groups meeting to, together to prepare a guide for the various upcoming election scenarios that you may face. And then there are conversations happening in, in small groups and, and broader trainings uh, that, that are possible. Great. For the question of related to, to, to defunding the police. Um, for me, this is a place where uh, meta has been talking about this for a long time. Uh, defunding police is kind of a localized version of, of war tax resistance. Um, it's, a, it's a sense of we want to divest from violence and invest in everything that leads to a holistic understanding of safety, protection, and love. And so, you know, uh, you know, Mennonite social media marketing, you know, it hasn't been so, so strong over the last 400 years. And so other people have been able to, to make the banners and the hashtags and, and do the work of saying, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, 
you know, this is what's up at this time, this type of the, the abolition movement. So in many ways, it's a, it's a great time for folks that, who are saying, defund police is a new idea, you know? And, you know, if you're a Mennonite, you can be like, yo, um, this is a great evangelism opportunity, you know? Hey, come to our church. We've been talking about this for a while. Come help us think about how we can say it more convincingly and effectively. But our faith is, is, is founded <laughs> on this sense of if harm be done, let it be done to me rather than you. And I will not invest in that which makes for war and and the importance of doing it collectively together and for a long time men is for informing groups of people that say we will not work for peace and then pay for war but but finding ways to to divert those resources and taking upon themselves together not individually but together the consequences of that so those are types of collective actions that we can take how can we bring these conversations into our communities of faith well, what, that's, that's one thing. Um, for example, if you want to talk about um, abolition or not using the police, you can convene a conversation within the church to say, um, how, uh, under what situations might we be able to find alternative ways to resolve a concern of uh, civilian safety without calling the police? Just start to ask those questions. All sorts of things will bubble up. Uh, a lot of uh, questions of fear or vulnerability, but once those are out in the open and can be spoken, then we can talk about what really matters. And we can, you know, also, uh, there's folks on here who've done great work on investigating the history of policing and where it comes from in terms of, um, you know, charting the bodies of enslaved Africans and formerly enslaved Africans, as well as you know, the proletariat and, you know, folks in the North. And so learning the history of, of the police and connecting that all the way back through how the Jesus movement was policed in the early days can be a through line. As well, it's a time to go back into Psalms and Proverbs and some and Lamentations in these aspects of our faith to, to give us sustenance for this time. I, I would say another way to bring this into faith communities is through expanding time for grief in our services. So not, ref, not uh, holding it onto just the joys and concerns section, but seeing if there might be an opening where each week we go beyond formulating our frustration uh, with the news or whatever in words, but we go into moaning into shaking, into yawning, into screaming. Like we need something more in our liturgy for these times. And look to some of the churches that have maintained some of these ways of moving in the spirit that helps to cleanse and heal their souls when cognitively our brains cannot literally process all that's coming in, but only it's by being together on Zoom or in person, at a distance, whatever, you can still feel the energy. If we make space for other expressions, um, tapping, some people use tapping to really help reset their bodies, twirling, moaning, groaning, these, you know, the groans of the spirit, too deep for words, this is biblical. So how can we get some groaning back in? Um, Cause we don't, we don't have the answers, but we, you know, the spirit is interceding at this time. So finding ways in the liturgy to open up uh, a holding of the levels of uncertainty. But the way you close that is going to be important as it's allowed to spill out, then, then lean into liturgical ways that say, nevertheless, we commit to keep breathing, to sustain others' breath, to keep in prayer, and to, and to, and to you know, not give in to the paralysis of the analysis, excuse the ableist analogy there, but to not come out of it with words, but through song and through ways of saying, finding just enough courage to get beyond the fear. You know, we carry the fear with us, but all we need is just a tiny bit more courage. So that's what I, that's what I would say. And as, and as church liturgies begin to change form during this time of COVID, yeah, find your grown group. Find your rage group. It might be only like five people, but some people who you can really open up with so that your organism is not trying to hold everything that is happening, but it can be returned to the earth. And then from there, the regenerative power, right? God became incarnate in the stuff of the earth. 
So we take that stuff of the earth to show up. That's my mini sermon for today. Let me get back to y'all's great questions. And if you come up with any grown liturgies, please, please pass them to me. Um, then we can, you know, circulate them around uh, so we can draw on each other's brilliance. Cool. Just a heads up that some of the resources that are coming up, there is a Mennonite Church USA racial justice fund. Just put, put your money where your mouth is in this case and just, you know, share with the fund as well as MCUSA is creating curriculum uh, about police abolition, which will be available in October, right on time. That's the October surprise I'm looking for. Uh, and, you know, it's going to give everything that we need. Just keep on building it. Uh, a lot of this is improvisation. We don't know it before. Thank you seeing here a number of you are saying how you're mobilizing and what you're doing and trying to be ready for how conflicts will be different at this time. Hmm. All right. Hmm. I think know that uh, we can and, and will survive. And although we will continue to see further deteriorations of, of democracy or, or so-called democracy, um, and, uh, again, reach out to folks outside the US. Uh, so some people have faced further deteriorations uh, of democracy. And, I mean, there hasn't been like a real federal government coalition in Belgium for like a long time. Different parties govern different parts of Kurdistan, um, it, the local the local areas may be able to to municipal. I mean, may be able to come to a new rise in power and reinvestment in local because people say, hey, no matter what's happening on the polarized levels, we want to stick together here um, and just be in those conversations to make sure that they're inclusive and thinking about the most marginalized and 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 when and when and when people say, yeah. You know, we're all going through a hard time. Ask who's the we. Always ask who is the we is included um, when we say, uh, when we say, for example, who's that we? Is it, is it your family? Is it your neighborhood? Make sure that your we is an inclusive, inclusive one. We have time for just a few more, just a few more questions. Now the chat is open. And you can say hey to your friends, and you can also uh, chat the questions. Or if you have any sense of your next step, no matter how small it is, go ahead and share that out because it will encourage your siblings here. I did see one that came in. Is my next step is figuring out what my next step is. Yeah, so that seems like I would say a next step of some deep self-reflection. Who am I? What am I called to do? Remember, you are your ancestors' gift to this moment. Yes, you are. So please show up with all you got. Someone's asking about what are the different uh, rules of engagement with, with white right wing groups. And again, it depends on, on the salt, on, on that size, on the activity, the location, and the time. It also depends on your particular demographics. I was speaking in our breakout room a bit. Uh, if you are someone um, with white skin privilege, you may be able to put yourself in a leverage point to find out information, to give some empathy, to do whatever it takes to de-escalate in a particular moment. Or you may be someone who can get in and get some information that then you can pass to more vulnerable communities about, about what's happening. So uh, these are currently uh, developing in terms of what are various ways to prevent violent extremism. And also it's the hard reality too is that although uh, right wing groups and, and folks affiliated with them are responsible for some of the highest levels of violence that, that we see, uh, the state responds very differently to them than it does to others who expressing desires for self-determination, justice, or equality. 
And so we're in a devastating reality of, of unequal and unfair um, ways that society is set up. So that's another thing to grieve and, and to pay attention to. Someone's asking about uh, salt as it relates to the internet. How do we determine the, the location online and what the, what the background is? Yes, these are key questions and they are uh, being discussed by various groups. But if you um, see something and want support on it, you know, feel free to reach out to me and others and we'll try to network you in uh, to, to start thinking well uh, about, about this. Um, but uh, what, what we've seen now is, although a lot of this has been developing online because they have been emboldened and encouraged overall from the, the highest levels of offices in the U.S., we're starting to see it manifest in the, in the physical plane, although many people do experience what's called doxing, where um, they have high levels of online threats towards them and against their story, and it can make things very difficult. I would say have a plan for... Um, for what you're going to be doing right now we're 40 days to the to the election and, and some uh from some some i know from a number of religious groups are doing prayer and fasting this is not prayer and fasting for a particular outcome necessarily it may be for some of them but a recognition that this election is yet another compression and flashpoint of, of what's happening right now so that's, that's an opportunity that's being coordinated. But I would say have a plan for what you will be doing that evening. And have a plan for checking up on your friends and members of vulnerable communities, especially in places that are not highly urbanized, but on, on these fringe areas where, where there will be more likely to be intimidation of people going to vote and things of that nature. Um, Probably no matter what the results are, people will, will take to the streets. And, and while that is, is totally understandable as, as a way of doing public grief work and stating the desire uh, for, for a world that works for all, we are also interested in terms of some of the groups I'm planning with and, and thinking about creative things that you can do together with people inside or gathered on, on Zoom or if those platforms shut down or things of that nature, other ways to to do data jams, for example, to uh, look across the, the internet to figure out uh, what is the data for what is happening. And what that does then is consolidate information so that um, you can be able to say coherent stats like the one that came to us uh, from uh, uh, BLM's work that one black person is killed every 28 hours by the state in this country. Right? That comes after working a lot of data. So you might think about getting a bunch of people together to, to, to do some citizen research or resident research um, on that day to, to figure out what's happening. Or to be able to say, this many congregations in our denomination are committed to being inclusive uh, groups. You know, you can find that data. That's one thing to do. You know, and if you got a quilt big enough, you can probably get six people around a quilt at a distance to like help us like metaphorically and physically restitch um, our society together. So just really try to, try to be creative about how we can involve everyone from the youth to the elders to do something very positive and powerful on that day that prepares us for Advent, that prepares us um, for decolonization, that prepares us for our discipleship journeys, which will become increasingly difficult, but there's more and more of us on the journey together. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah, I kick it back over to you all. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sarah, for being with us. And thank you so much to everyone who is in this room. This is a beautiful and powerful group together. So it is good to be together in this work, in, in thinking and in mobilizing for, for to put the power of nonviolence into practice and to, to mobilize and participate in movements for justice. So thank you, Sarah, and thank you to everyone. And we want to just say a word about what's coming up next. This is the first part of a four-part series. Next week, I will share with you very briefly um, a, um, 
a flyer with the information here. Next week, Maria Steffen, director of the Nonviolence Action at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and David Courtright, director of the Global Policy Initiative at the University of Notre Dame's Kroc Institute, will be with us for this gathering. The week after that, on October 7th, co-coordinator of the Poor People's Campaign, Liz Theo Harris, will be with us. And to cap off the series, we're going to have a nonviolent direct action training. So in response to some of your questions and particular requests on that front, October 10th in the afternoon, we'll have a nonviolent direct action training led by Ashley Bohr of the Kroc Institute for International Peace and her co-facilitator, Nate Cohen of Northwestern University. So uh, with this registration, you are already registered for that. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>